This is an interview with Ralph Reinhardt on February 14th, 2008. We're in the studio at WILL in Urbana, Illinois. Henry Radcliffe is doing the videography, and my name is Nancy Rotzel. I'll be interviewing. Okay, Ralph, where were you when the news came over about, world, about uh, Pearl Harbor? I was uh, listening to the football game between the Chicago Bears and, and the New York Giants. It was a Sunday afternoon, and my brother, who was in the Air Force at, at Rantoul, and one of his buddies was, uh, was there with me. And during the game, they came on with a special uh, announcement that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. I that mean, was December the 6th, I think, 1941. Yeah, the 7th, I think. Well, that's a must have been an amazing thing to be sitting there with yes, two people they, who were in the service. They also came on and uh, said that any serviceman that was listening to this message was to report back to their outfit immediately. So they both got in the car and headed back for Rantoul. All right, after that, did you go in the service right away, or how did you, how did you get in the service? No, I, before Pearl Harbor, the draft was instituted, and um, my number came up number five. So I was called almost immediately to be examined for the service. I did that at the uh, St. Mary's Hospital in Decatur, Illinois, and I failed that examination and they marked me as a, a, a one and uh, I proceeded to uh, get the problem solved and uh, then I became subject to going into the service at that time. I took another examination and uh, passed it and I had to wait a while for my false teeth to get put into my mouth so I could go and I could eat while I was in the army. And so I went into the Army on uh, April the 11th, 1942. How old were you then? That was in Decatur. Right. How old were you? I was, tw I was 22 years old. You want to tell me what, where you went from there? Yes. Uh, I was inducted in the Army in Peoria, Illinois on April the 11th. I took an interurban from uh, Decatur, Illinois to Peoria. They had interurbans at that time. And uh, after being inducted in the Army, we left and went to Scotts Field, which is in Belleville, Illinois. I went by train there. And uh, we were issued our, our uniforms and clothes, and, and uh, we got shot for about five days medicines and all that, the requirements that you had to go through to stay in the Army. And from there, why I took a train to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and that's where I had my basic training in the field artillery. Learned how to fire a, um, uh, an old cannon that they'd used in World War I. You can understand how poorly we were armed when war broke out. And they had old World War I weapons that we were learning to fire. So I learned which was my left foot and which was my right foot in my drills. And uh, when we finished the uh, uh, training, why well, I embarked on a, uh, a train and heading for Oakland, California. That support of embarkation. And I was uh, stationed there in an old international harvesting building with probably about 4,000 other GIs, mostly from Fort Sill and from a fort uh, down in uh, Texas. And we were going to leave the uh, states. And we left San Francisco on the 11th day of June, or the 21st day, I'm sorry. And I left on the Matsonia, which was a luxury liner that used to be used in running from uh, California to Hawaii. 
and it was named after Bernard Matson. He owned a, a Notion line cruisers. He had about four altogether. I don't recall the other names of them. But anyway, I was 25 days at sea, and we finally sighted Melbourne, Australia, on July the 16th, 1942. And uh, I was in camp there in a in a in a place called Camp Darley. It was in a, a small village, Bacchus Marsh, just outside of uh, Melbourne. And I was there for 14 days, and we were known as what is was casual. We weren't assigned to any outfit. We were just all in the same boat. There's about 4,000 of us. We were we waited there until we were uh, transferred into the outfits that we were going to go into, and it took them that long before they finally decided where all of us would go. So you didn't know where your assignment was didn't going know to be where or what we your job was in. going to be? At, the, at that time, while the uh, thir uh, 32nd Division was being formed to fight the Japanese in, in, uh, in uh, New Guinea, because New Guinea and uh, was was half of it was held by the Japanese at that time, but anyway, I got lucky, and I uh, went on a train to uh, Sydney, Australia, and I was told that uh, said you couldn't pick a better place, and I agree with them. The girls were just beautiful. And I stayed there for about four or five months, stationed there, working in a, in what was called a, uh, uh, the outfit was called the, uh, uh, I lost that for a minute. And I was, uh, I was a warehouseman. And this outfit that I was attached to was to do with transportation of troops and ships and all that unloaded ships and all. And uh, I spent that time in, in Sydney, just not just working for uh, the warehouse. And then I left uh, Sydney on February the 19th with 19 other guys, 19 other soldiers and we were headed for uh, New Guinea by way of Brisbane and Townsville. We were to go up and form the first boat company that was formed in the Southwest Pacific area, the, the, the 620 boat company. Our, our number was changed a variety of times, but that was our first uh, place. Was We traveled up the coast of uh, New Guinea on air or on Australia, on a train, with the uh, other nineteen fellows, and we arrived in Townsville, and then we caught a Dutch ship, and crossed the Coral Sea, and landed in Port Moresby on the seventh. And I was at Port Moresby for quite some time. And uh, what was your job there? Uh, I had a variety of jobs. I started out with uh, on a uh, tugboat as a deck, just a, a seaman. Uh, we helped uh, tie up the ships and all. And then uh, we eventually lost our our uh, tugboats, and the Australian civilians took over our job, and that was our. That was our pre preliminary to going on to uh, New Guinea, uh, further up the coast. So meanwhile, in, uh, on September the 3rd, while I was in Sydney, I uh, had a furlough. And uh, I flew down from uh, Port Moresby to Sydney by way of, well, I didn't go into Sydney, I went into B Brisbane by going through from uh, into there and then down to Brisbane. 
and spent my furlough. I won't go any further on that. I eventually went back to Brisbane and back to New Guinea and back to Moresby. But then on March 13th, our whole company is about uh, 1,500, about 150 guys. We in, we emplaned on a uh, a plane to Lay, New Guinea, and the entire outfit was with us, and we went over what they call over the hump, and we landed on the other side. Now, as I found out later on, the reason we we moved was because we were generally about uh, three months behind the the major push in the Pacific. We we always generally come into those ports that they had freed, and uh, they had quite a battle in New Guinea, and they finally ousted all the Japanese, and uh, we moved into Ley. And uh, when, while we were in Ley, we uh, we started to um, working on landing craft mechanized. That's LCMs. They were a small edition of the big ships that they used in the invasion of uh, of Ill of uh, of uh, the. Uh, I have a little trouble uh, with uh, when we when we landed troops in the in the eastern part of the war, in the Pacific, or... They went into all the small islands then, or...? Well, we, then we, um, I operated an LCM for quite some time, and then the, uh, they finally come up, the, uh, the Army did with a vehicle called, a, they called it a duck. It was a rubberized truck, and it could float on water. And um, what what they they replaced the uh, the way that we the way I, we unloaded ships was we uh, backed the those LCMs off of the uh, uh, sand, and the trucks would pull on to the, the the LCM, and then we'd back off, and then and we'd take them out to the ships in the stream and they would load their ships. But these ducks came along, and uh, the, um, you know, as you know, very sadly, the army was separated into white people and black people. And most of the blacks did the heavy work. They did all the hauling of, uh, uh, of the equipment as it come off of the ships. But they took over these ducks and they just drive them into the water, and then just go on out into the into the, into the harbor, and park alongside the ship. And they would load the the duck, and uh, and the duck would just motor on in and go out. So, but then we knew that we weren't long for there for for lay. And uh, during that time, I took a furlough. Again, to uh, I, I took a, a boat to Finchhofen. It was in the northern part, on right along the coast of New Guinea, and I went down to Australia and, and for another furlough. When I returned to uh, from that furlough, why we moved. And uh, we were to move to uh, uh, the Philippines. They had um, cleaned out the Japanese from pretty much from Medela. And uh, we were about three months after that happened. And we moved into, uh, into uh, Manila. And that's where I operated a tugboat in the Manila Harbor until the war ended. What did they use tugboats for? What did they use the tugboats for? Well, we hauled barges. Uh, we would pick up, a, a, they put most of the barges along what, they had a river that run from Manila, the main city, 
down to the ocean. And we would go over and with our tugboat, we'd get orders to go over and pick up a, a, a barge, and we'd take it over and take it out to a ship where they were un, they'd, un, they'd unload whatever they had to unload on that barge, and then we'd bring it back in to the to the harbor so that they could unload it. So it was supplies for the for the army. Was it supplies for the army? Well, it was supplies for everything. Yes. Uh, most of this was brought in by Liberty ships. You know, they were a ship that was used. And uh, I had several experiences on there. On uh, that were, it was interesting. And uh, I recall one time that I was assigned the uh, to take the harbor master along. The harbor master was the was the fellow that went out and uh, and would take over the big ships that came in, and he would guide the men. He'd bring the men. He'd just take over for the captain, and he'd drive men along the dock, and I uh, take him out to the uh, to the boat and put him on that boat on that boat, and then I would stand off and wait until. He gave me orders, and then they'd move into the dock, and I'd go in and help push in the ships in the harbor. And uh, on one occasion, I was with the harbor master, and uh, it was after the war was over, and I was assigned to the harbor master, and I picked him up, and we moved into the uh, harbor, and I noticed a large ship there that we were heading for, and uh, they had a, it was a troop ship. And this was about eight, nine days after the war had ended. And I noticed it was filled with soldiers. It was probably somewhere in the vicinity of 4,000 people standing there. And they were hollering at us. Where are we at? Where are we at? They didn't know where they were at. So I pulled up and I let the, the, the harbor master off and I, they have a place that they put down from the ship. And uh, I got to talking to one of the fellows that was that came down. And I said, where are you guys from? He said, well, we were heading to England, Europe. And the war ended. And they just turned us around. And instead of going there, we went on down, we went all the way around Africa and on up into the, uh, to the they got to uh, the Philippines and they didn't have one clue where they'd been. They'd been on there for 13 days. Wow. And it was just amazing. I couldn't hardly understand. But they didn't know where they were at. And, of course, a couple of guys on my boat, it was funny, you know, they said, well, this is San Francisco, you know. Well, it wasn't. It, when they found out it was, uh, uh, they were in uh, the Philippines, it was just a great big sigh went out amongst all those pl uh, soldiers up there. Do you have any idea where they were headed? No, I, you know, I've searched everything. I have for years to find out. I, I talked to this fellow, and he said they didn't know where they was at, and I traced the trip that they probably had to make. And for them to spend that many days on there. Now, we didn't know where we were going when we went over. We had a good idea. They didn't tell us where we were going when we went to uh, uh, Australia. But we knew that at that time, the, the Japanese pretty well controlled the Pacific Ocean. And we went down, uh, as I found out later on, our course took us down along the uh, uh, South American Peninsula, then we came up uh, underneath the New New Zealand before we went on into uh, to Australia. Had you ever been on a on a ship before? Never had been, and I we had eventually three three hundred people's in our outfit. I didn't run into one of them that ever been on the ocean or ever been in a big lake. So that was the way the army picked their personnel. New experience. <laughs> no experience.
They teach you the experience. But anyway, from there, I, uh, of course, the war ended. And uh, that was quite an occasion. I, I submitted the place that, uh, I, uh, 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 how that happened to the internet on WILL. Tell me, how did it happen? What was the celebration like? Well, I was on, as I said, I was on a tugboat. And uh, we were sitting one night on, on our tugboat. And we had one of the men that was, was on a crew on my boat. I was a, I was a skipper. I had a, a, an engineer. And I had, at that time, I think I had three deckhands. And one of them, was, his name was, um, I thought I'd never forget his name, but I probably will. Uh, but he was, uh, Nick Pusey was his name. And he was an Italian, and he very uh, emotional. And he come back. He'd been on a, a, a leave to uh, Manila, the city of Manila. And uh, he come aboard, and he said, uh, "I heard they just dropped a bomb on uh, uh, Japan, and it uh, blew a whole city away." Well, we said, "Sit down, Nick. You know, sounds like you got a hold of some bad whiskey." But there was a boat sitting right behind me, and he, he got he had overheard our conversation, and he said, "Yeah, the, they did drop one. Well, they had already dropped a bomb, and we weren't aware of it. The first bomb we we didn't know of until after we found found out about this one. But all the ships in the harbor started shooting off their guns in celebration, because they all kind of felt that this." Well, they come on the radio, and they had provisions that uh, the Japanese wanted to be assured that their emperor wouldn't be held as a captive. And if we agreed to that, they'd surrender. And uh, that took three or four days. And, and I was in Manila at the time they surrendered. It was 5 o'clock in the evening. And I was with several other of my buddies, and somebody... Uh, leaned out of a window and said, the war's over, the war's over. And we, we were expecting it. We were very expectant. I bet you celebrated. We celebrated a little bit. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. So I finally got to go home about two months after that. I came back on the, U, uh, the SS Uruguay. That was a ship from, the, from Uruguay, South America. And the Japanese had, or the, <laughs> uh, the army had taken over that boat to use it as a, 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 a keep ship. guys back to the uh, yeah. to the states. And uh, we had one episode that was amusing. The Navy had a hat. This was operated by the Navy. The Navy had a, uh, a habit of having beans for breakfast. And I guess I talked to a lot of sailors, and they said, yeah, they had beans for breakfast practically all the time. Well, this was a, a troop ship with 4,000 guys on it. And they all had to relieve themselves at the same time. And there just wasn't enough facilities to take care of it. That was a sight to see. And I was lucky because I didn't like beans. I didn't eat beans. <laughs> so when you came back, what, where did you come into the United States? Well, I came into uh, uh, oh, my other daughter. She was uh, come in to near uh, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Oh, I had that here. You're reading no. from a journal. Did you keep that all during the war? Mm -hmm. Did you keep that journal every day yes, during the war? Yes, yes. This, this isn't all the journal. This is just papers that I brought along. But uh, we come back. I come back on the Uruguay. And uh, we arrived in uh, 
San Pedro, California. And uh, we uh, got off of the ship and went into San, San Pedro and went into a, a, a camp. And uh, it was the first time that I'd had, had uh, could use a telephone. So when I uh, we got in and got situated in our camp, the first place I headed for was the phone. And I called my mother and father. While, while you were gone, how often did you get mail or how did you get information? Well, it was forth? about three and a half years before I got home again when I left. I left and never did come home right. until the war was over. Right. And during that time, though, did you wrote, your parents wrote to you, or? Oh, yeah, we, we wrote all the time. You know, my mother was, she kept me informed of everything that was going on. She wrote a real good letter. My dad, he threw in a letter here and there, and I wrote to them regularly. But no telephones? No telephoning? You couldn't telephone, not in those days. That was 1942, 43, 44. We didn't know what was going on in the rest of the world. They never told us anything. We were just on an island, and we had ourselves to amuse, except we, we used to get movies. The USO occasionally had a show come in, and we'd, we'd attend that. But most of the time, we just sat around. A lot of guys played cards. I wasn't, I didn't care much about playing cards, so we spent the evening just sitting around talking to each other about uh, what we did when we was in civilian life. And uh, most of the time we worked. I worked on tugboat. I worked six hours on and 12 hours off. So we worked 12 hours every 24 hours, and that we just, that was just a rotation. We did that all the time all the time I was on boats. So, and then of course, uh, when we got into Lay, New Guinea, we could, uh, we started playing uh, softball and, and basketball. And uh, I played on softball team and also played on our company uh, basketball team. So that was real nice when we were in Lay. That was the best place we had. Where did you all stay? Stay, did you stay on board ships or did you stay on the well, island? Well, only when we was on the ship. No, we had tents. We made, we built our own camp. We had carpenters and uh, we put mosquito bars up and of course the weather was always hot. But uh, we were near the sea and there was always a nice breeze at night. In fact, it would get cold enough you had to wear a shirt at night. And when we were working on the uh, tugboats at night, it'd get pretty cool. And then when it would rain, it would be pretty miserable with the cold weather. Little different from Midwest. Hmm? Little different from the Midwest. Yes, uh, yes. I never, uh, when I left in 1942, I didn't see winter again until I came home. And I can recall when we got off of the boat, the Uruguay, and we went into San Pedro, and there's 4,000 guys, and they all standing around. We had our overcoats on, and we had a, an officer talk to all of us in the big, big arena, and he said, whatever you do, don't let go of those overcoats. He said, it's cold all over these 48 states of America. <laughs> that was in October of 1945, so you can go back and check and see what happened that winter. It was a cold winter. Tell me, what's what's the emblem on your left shoulder? Oh, that's my sergeant stripes. I was a sergeant. Oh, and what's up on, what's higher? So that, which one, or oh, which is this, is a dice? Yes. I think that was the, when I, when I left, I was just uh, transferred into a division that all, they all, they all were coming home and they just fitted in all guys like me that was coming out of individual companies. 
and they transferred me, me into that division. And all I was in it was on the boat coming back. This over here is for the boat company. Okay. So you have dice on one shoulder and a, mm -hmm. and a, st and a uh, wheel on the other one. Yeah, that, the wheel is a, uh, that. Right. And this is, uh, for every six months I spent overseas. There's six of them. And I, I didn't completely serve out the seventh one. I was there 30, about 39 months. Looking back on it, when you look back on it, what would you tell somebody it was like? Well, it was interesting. I enjoyed it. I went through one air raid in when we were in Port Moresby. But very luckily, the Japanese sent a hundred planes over us and I was sitting right out on the mountain top and watching them go over. And uh, we shot down, our, our uh, ACAC guns shot down about 30 or 40 of them. And they went right over, right over the ocean, right over the harbor. And uh, when, when it was true, I was sitting in a trench and we were a bunch of us soldiers and sitting there. We didn't get in the trench because there's about a foot of water in the bottom of the trench. And I told a guy next to me, I'm not going in there until I hear a bomb. But they went over our head, and it's just like watching a show. I was sitting there watching those ships, or those airplanes, and all the ak ak guns were firing at them. And every once in a while, they'd hit one of those ships. And when they did, we, they were flying, just coming through, going over the ocean. And when that ship would get hit, it would break formation and head out to sea. And you could look over to the left and see a, a, our fighter plane going after it. So when they, got, when they got hit, they got shot down. And the next day, the paper in New Guinea said they'd shot down almost half of them. Different time. So, uh, yeah, I, I, rec I recall the, um, there was a fellow sitting next to me. It was a lieutenant. And he, after this all happened, they went by. We wondered what was going on. And he looked back, he says, oh boy, look, there's a big storm coming up. Look at all that clouds back here. It wasn't clouds, it's smoke. What they did, they hit a gas dump just outside of uh, Port Moresby. It's only about two or three miles from where we were at. And from what I could un found out, it's only about, there were six guys that got killed in that, at that company. But that was their main objective. It's just hard to believe seeing all those airplanes flying over you and not, not dropping any bombs on you, but we were fortunate. At the same time, they hit us, they hit uh, Oro Bay and Milne Bay. Lay and El all those uh, uh, fill or ports are just one right after the other. And they hit all three of those on three days. And uh, the outfit that I had been in, that was the... Uh, Ship and Gun Crew Command Number One. I was trying to think of the name of it, and uh, it's two of two, three, three of my buddies were killed on that ship. The Japs dropped a bomb right on the sh the gun that they were on, and they were killed. But we were lucky. We were very lucky in, in Port Moresby. Did you remain friends with many of the men you served with? Uh, yes, a lot of them. All of them were my friends. That was one thing. We had a small enough outfit, and all we had was a jungle. And we, well, we had our, our companies always situated right along the, the harbor. We weren't clear into the jungles. We were on the edge of the jungles. And uh, we were told that when we moved in there, that we moved up on the top of the hill overlooking the harbor. 
and uh, in, on, in the hill, the Japanese, when they were beginning to lose the war, they hid in those caves. They had caves down in there. And we were told not to go into those caves. And I talked to a, a, a couple of, of, of Australian fighters. You know, these were the guys that fought over in, uh, in Italy. Uh, they were called the uh, rat, uh, desert rats. And they went all through that campaign. And they came back to uh, Australia. And what did they do? They just sent them on over to, <laughs> to fight the Japanese. And uh, from what, what I'd talked to most of the Americans, and they said those uh, uh, Aussie soldiers was the meanest soldiers they ever saw. <laughs> and I could understand why they was mean. <laughs> when I was in Sydney, I'm getting wound up now, when I was in Sydney, the early part of when we first got there, the uh, desert rats, I called them, came home from uh, Italy on a ship. This big ship came in, and they, they, they pulled into the docks in Sydney that night. And... Uh, the next day, the next night, yes, it was yeah, the night they came in, the next night, there was about 12 soldiers that was killed that night by other soldiers. The Japanese came home and they found their wives or their loved ones going with, all, with the U.S. US soldiers. The that Australians. Was quite, General MacArthur came out and he made a decision I didn't think he should have made, but he he let us out, Americans out, one night on a furlough, on leave, and the next night the, the Australians could come out, not together. And I thought he was in wrong because here these boys had went through a terrible war and come home and they, were, they didn't even allow them to get out on the streets of their own town. Was that because they were afraid of fighting between the... Oh, yeah. Uh, it's it something you had to be real careful about. I remember one time I came home. See, you got me started now. I came home and from a date I'd had, and, and I had to come about two miles getting off of the train. I had to go through what was called King's Cross. And that was a crossing place of, of Sydney. Everybody knew where King's Cross was at. Our, uh, we were bivouacked in a, in a, a former uh, a place for nuns that went to... Uh, a convent. A convent. It was about six stories high, and they, and they moved out, and we moved in. And it was about four blocks from the, uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, this place I went through. And I came through there one night. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. And as I went through it, there was a couple of Australian soldiers come out of a, uh, they were back in the store uh, front. And they hollered out, hey, Yank, you got a smoke? And I didn't say a word. I just took off running. And I run about a half a mile, just as fast as I could run. And they were right on my tail. And I knew if they caught me, they was going to beat me up. But I outrun them. <laughs> Maybe they just wanted a cigarette. <laughs> yeah, you got to be kidding. <laughs> That's what somebody told me once. <laughs> No, I knew what they were after. I never did. I never did have any trouble with Australians. I knew some awful, nice Australian women, of course, and I knew I had some Australian friends. You said you went back to Australia. I went back there in 1972. Did you and see a lot of change? No, Australia was not a country that changed much. They were just. They even had the trams. 
you know, we call them street cars. I, I still rode a tram when I went back over there. Everything I found, e I find everything easily when I got there. I stayed at a, uh, what was then a hotel, was just across the street from um, one of the popular places on that part of the of Australia. And uh, now I lost my train of thought. Uh, well, if you saw a lot of, if you didn't see many changes, you must have found it easy to get around. If you didn't find a lot of changes there, you must have found it easy to get around. Did you go yes, to it, any of the, any of the harbors? No. Well, I went up to New Guinea, and I just went to uh, Port Moresby. I didn't want to go any further than that, and I had a good time there. I saw, it had it, it had changed great a great deal. Because it was just a, a very small village when I was there, and it was a town, I guess, of about forty thousand. Uh, mostly, it was uh, native people there. Well, when you when you, where where did you get out of the army? Where were you when you got out of the army? Oh, when I got out of the army, uh, I went to um, from San Pedro. I went to Fort Logan, Colorado. And I got discharged. That was in, that's in Denver, Colorado. And I got discharged on November the fifth, nineteen forty-five. And uh, I uh, caught a train there. When I went out, I caught a train to St. Louis. The the Bluebird, the old Bluebird. It's gone now. It was a great train. And. Uh, it ran all the way into uh, to St. Louis. Were there a lot no, of, I, a lot I, of I'm other... sorry. I, I, I took another train. I got on the Bluebird to come home from St. Louis. Were there a lot of other soldiers who were Yes, on... coming out of uh, Fort Logan, they practically the whole train was full of soldiers. Not just uh, Army, but Marines and all that had got out. They were all, most all of them were on the way home. I bet your family was glad to see you. Hmm? I imagine your family was glad to see you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had quite a celebration. I, my, when I come in, when I uh, come into the train station, my dad and my young sister was there to meet me. Now, she was only 11 years old when I left, and there she was all grown up. She's only 11 years old. I couldn't hardly take my eyes off of her. But then they picked us up and and uh, we went home and we had a, quite a celebration then. When did your brother come home? He beat me home. He went over after I did. He he went to the other theater of operation. He was in, uh, um, oh, what's the one they made? Casablanca. He was in the Air Force. He was a master sergeant, and uh, he was in he was in the same division I was in. He's in transportation. He handled all the uh, uh, mostly what he says was the movie stars and any politicians coming through there. Why they they landed there at that airport, and then he made arrangements to get them where they was going. He met a lot of interesting people. Was he there when you got home? Yeah, he was there when I got home. He he got home a couple, of, a little bit before I did, a couple of months before I did. What did you do after you got home? Well, <laughs> uh, I tried to have a good time. Uh, I'd had a girlfriend when I when I left, and, uh, but we didn't seem to jive, I guess you'd say. But strangely enough, seven years later, I married her. And did you just go back to the same job you had before you left? Uh, well, when I left, I had um, been on what they call just a, a, the extra board. Okay. And uh, you, we'd call in, and they'd, they'd assign you to a what job you had that day, 
and you'd come in and work at the various parts dailies. And eventually I bid into the uh, millwright shop and then I bid into the uh, 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 brick mason's trade, which I didn't like either one of them. Uh, I played baseball with the Staley baseball team. I guess I tell a lot of people that's one reason I stayed. I loved to play baseball and I played baseball for 19... 46 and 47 and then I decided it's time for me to get on the stick and do something with my life. So there was a fellow that came into our brick masons unit and I got acquainted with him and his wife was a teacher at Brown's Business College and I got him to bring me a, 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 a something on the, the school. And that's how I got interested in going to Browns. So in 1948, I, I took a leave of absence from Staley's and went to uh, the uh, Browns Business College on the GI Bill. GI Bill did a lot for people, didn't it? Yes, it did. A lot, an awful lot of them took advantage of it. And when I got through there, I took a correspondence course and they paid for that also. And I landed the job because of that, because the fellow that was grading my, uh, my uh, papers that I was sending in was in, from Paris, Illinois. And when I finished my course and took my final examination with that school, uh, I called them and asked them if uh, they knew anyone a CPA that was looking for someone, you know, young like me. And they said, no, they didn't do that sort of thing. But uh, Bill Parrish in Paris, Illinois, was looking for someone. So I called him immediately and went over and talked to him and interviewed and, and, and hired me. So I worked for a year and a half for Bill. And then I, st uh, I worked for... Um, uh, a couple of small manufacturing companies in Decatur. Uh, the, uh, eventually wound up with Home Manufacturing Company. And uh, I worked there until uh, I quit when I, I did taking uh, counting jobs on the side. And when I, I told my wife when I got making enough, as much money as I was making at Home Manufacturing Company, on a part-time job, I was going to quit, so I did. I quit and went in business for myself. So the war completely changed your life? Changed my life completely. Was it all worth it? Yes. I'd do it again if I knew I was going to come out alive, but <laughs> there was some of them that didn't spend very much time over there and it died. They were the real heroes. and. And you talk about anybody that made an impression on me. I had a buddy. His name was, uh, uh, here I go with my names. His name, he was an Italian. And uh, Barney, Barney Verdicchio. He lived in the, in the Bronx in New York. And he was... Uh, he was the light of our life while we were in the, in the service in the, in the jungles. He, has an, he was an impressionist. He could imitate anybody. He was very good at Joe E. Brown, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, his wife, and uh, Joe, Brown, Joe E. Brown. And uh, uh, he, was, he eventually wanted to imitate Gary Cooper, in giving that uh, address that he gave when he made the movie about uh, uh, the baseball player, the famous baseball player that made a speech. He had that, oh, Lou Gehrig. He had the Lou Gehrig disease. And uh, he kept all of us guys he was funny all the time. He worked in the kitchen, 
And when you went in there to get something to eat, he had a joke for everybody that come along that line, or he was imitating somebody. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little worried about him. He's uh, older than I am. And he and I have corresponded ever since we, you know, knew each other. But I sent him a birthday card this year and sent him a, uh, a copy of that thing I made on Internet and a letter. And I haven't heard from him. And it's been a month. And I got a card, and the only address on it was his wife's name. She didn't say anything about Barney. So I'm kind of anxious. I'm going to have to find out what happened to him. But he, he really was something else. And I remembered him. He was better than any officer I ever knew. <laughs> he really was worked, worked for that outfit. Is that how you all got through it? Hmm? Is that how That's you... how we all got through it. It's humor. He never let us forget it, you know. And I, he, he was, he played second base and I played shortstop. And he always used to say that the best double play combination in the islands. <laughs> and we were. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to add or would you like to say to people about your experience? Well, it was a very worthwhile experience. I enjoyed every bit of it, it you know. Uh, there were times that you kind of got down, but when you had a guy like Barney around, well, he brought you back up. And uh, I wouldn't have, uh, I, when I left that outfit, there were 300 friends. We've gone through a lot together. That's good. I'll end with that. We, we just said, um, I had 300 friends, and yeah. I tried to keep tra track of all of them, yeah. and I did for a long time, but eventually a lot of them died off, evidently, and Barney is the only one that he and I have kept in constant contact with. 